All right, let's open our Bibles, if you have your Bible, to Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. And this is the verse that I gave in the previous lesson when we studied salvation and some of the confusion that the mainline churches get into. I gave this verse because in the NIV, I'm going to read it to you here in Mark chapter 10 out of the King James, and then we'll, I'll tell you what the NIV says for those of you who might have forgotten. Notice in the King James Bible what Jesus says in Mark 10, 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? In the NIV, the Bible says, or the supposed Bible says, the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I understand the context, and you could decipher from the context, but when you take that verse as it stands, and if you were to look at that verse, it says in the NIV that it's hard to enter the kingdom of God. What I want to look at tonight, just seven small points <laughs> about the simplicity of salvation. Kind of to sum up our whole series, and I hope you've been able to watch or listen to the eight messages on salvation, but nothing real heavy tonight, but I wanted to give you something that hopefully will encourage you about the simplicity. I mean, let's think about it. The most important thing for anyone for all eternity, is God going to make it complicated? I believe He made it simple, and He made it easy that a child could understand it. So I want to look at that just for a few minutes here Tonight, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the text. I pray that you'd help us as we study this subject, Lord, to rejoice in the fact of your simple gospel. And Lord, I pray that you might confirm and encourage us in the truth of God. We thank you so much for the truth that we have it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, when I gave the previous lesson, I've kind of divorced us from the whole uh, Catholic side of the argument. In other words, when you study Roman Catholicism as well as in the 11th century Roman Catholicism split and you had the division between the Western and the Eastern Church. So you have what they call the Orthodox Church. Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, which is a huge, you know, millions of people as well. But I pretty much didn't even include them because they believe what we taught as far as sacramentalism. In other words, sacraments actually save you. In other words, they state it. You have to be a member of our church and you have to take these sacraments and do these sacraments. Roman Catholicism has seven, I believe. And you have to do these in order to go to heaven. So they flat out state that, so we pretty much didn't spend time with them last time. However, as we got into some of the confusion with the quote-unquote evangelical mainline denominations like Lutherans, like uh, Reformed, Orthodox, and like uh, Presbyterians and United Methodists, and even when we got into the Assembly of God and Pentecostal churches, we found these statements that added a lot of confusion. You can see, at least I could, as I was looking through just main statements. I'm not even dealing with, you know, uh, non-denominational groups. As a matter of fact, you might get the gospel better by going to a non-denominational church than you would a mainline denominational church. This church right up here, Presbyterian Church, is the li most liberal denomination of the Presbyterians in existence. Presbyterian Church USA. And so when you begin to look at that, you understand why you meet somebody at the water cooler at work or you're talking to somebody and they say, yeah, well, or you say, well, I don't know, I got baptized. Where do they get that stuff? They get it from churches. That's where they get this stuff. Or you say, well, I, I, I took communion. Or you say, well, I used to be saved. There's your Assembly of God Pentecostal Arminians, Wesleyans, uh, 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 United Methodists. That's where this stuff trickles down from. And so I want to just kind of clear the air. God has made it simple. You can believe the gospel. You can be saved. And you can know that you're saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So i got seven easy things. We'll check them off and be done. Number one, salvation is simple. It's not found in a creed, but it's found in Christ. It's easy to remember. It's not a creed, but Christ. You have the Apostles' Creed, 120 to 250. You have the Nicene Creed, 325 A.D. The Chalcedonian Creed, 451. I quoted uh, probably from the Westminster Confession of Faith, a very uh, popular creed. Presbyterians make reference to it. 
uh, maybe even sometimes the Lutherans or the Reform doctrine, they make reference to the Westminster Confession of Faith. You say, what is it? It's Calvinism is what that is. Now look over in John chapter number 1. Look at this. We'll hit these verses kind of quick because I want to move through these seven points. John chapter number 1. Notice that salvation is simple. It's in, a, it's in Jesus Christ, not a creed. John chapter number 1. And this is what you want to always keep at the forefront when you deal with someone. You're not trying to convert them to Baptist. You're not trying to convert them to Calvary Baptist. You're not trying to convert them to evangelicalism. You're trying to get them to receive Jesus Christ, a person. It's about Jesus. John chapter 1, look at it, verse 11. He came into his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received the creed. But as many as received the church. No, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. It's about Jesus Christ. Turn over to Acts chapter 16. You know the verse. You don't even have to turn really, but Acts chapter 16, verse number 31. We've quoted this many times in this series of salvation. When Paul is in jail, and of course, talk about jailhouse rock, they have it because everything falls to pieces. And I'm sorry for the uh, liberal, uh, secular, wicked references. I apologize for that. But they have this revival in a jail. And Paul doesn't say, okay, let's go through the creed. Can you repeat after me? And can you take this and join my church and take the side? He doesn't do any of that. Acts chapter 16, verse number 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Is it complicated? Verse 31, no, it's not complicated. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. If your house believes on Jesus, they'll be saved too. And of course they all do, and then they all get baptized. 33 and 34, after they're converted. All right, look over in Romans chapter number 5. Take a right turn, Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5, look down, if you will, in verse number 10. Romans chapter 5, verse number 10. We cited this a lot in our lessons. Romans 5, verse number 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom... We have now received the atonement. It's about Christ, not a creed. If you're saved, Jesus Christ saved you. I know sometimes new converts get confused, and I've had them say, yeah, you remember uh, the, the preacher saved me. <laughs> now, I know what they mean. I led them to Christ. I showed them how to be saved. They don't understand all the terms yet. But if you've ever been saved, no preacher saved you, no church saved you, no creed saved you, Jesus saved you. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. All right, number two. Salvation is not centered around religion, but a relationship. You don't have to turn for these. I'll just give these to you because you already know them. John chapter 3 and John chapter number 4. In John chapter 3, we have Nicodemus. And it's interesting. The end of John chapter 2, it says Jesus didn't need that any man testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. So this idea brings the whole thing into perspective. When Nicodemus goes up to Christ, he says, Hey, uh, Rabbi, that's a religious term, you're doing all these miracles. And he's trying to talk to Christ because Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. He's a Pharisee. He's all wrapped up in religion. But salvation is not centered around a religion. It's centered around a relationship. Jesus cut to the chase and said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. In chapter 4, we have a good man. In chapter 3, we have a bad woman. In chapter number 4, and she gets into this argument with Christ. You've got to give it to the gal. I mean, she's bold enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus. And she's just going back and forth, you know, and she's like, well, our fathers, you know, us Samaritans, you know, we worship over here, and you say in Jerusalem. And Jesus is like, well, salvation's of the Jews. But then he gets the thing all the way down after he deals with her sin problem. He gets the thing all the way narrowed down to the fact that he is the Messiah. He says, I that speak unto thee am he. And she dropped her water pot then. You see, it's not about a church. It's not about a creed. It's about Jesus Christ, the man. And it's not about a religion.
Thank God we have a place we can come. And it's good to be able to see your faces. Amen. This is the first time I've been in church doing service with live people at a nighttime service since March the 17th or 18th, whatever it was. It's a blessing to be in church. I'm going to go home and not know what to do. I guess I need to go home and eat popcorn or cheese toast or I think we have pork chops tonight. Amen. Uh, it's a blessing to have church. And I thank God. I'm even thankful that there are other religions in America. You think I'm weird. But I'm glad that we have some freedoms because people like to have religious freedom regardless of their religion. I'm glad we have a re religious freedom in America. You want to worship, you know, whatever crazy you want to worship, go ahead and do it. I'm glad that we have the freedom to do that. Because then we get the freedom to do what we're doing. So praise the Lord for that. But your salvation is not contingent upon this religious organization. We have to be an organization in order to pay light bills and do things like that. But the church, the body of Jesus Christ, is an organism. If you're saved, you're in Jesus Christ. You're not in the old man, which is Adam. You're in the new man, which is Christ. You might be a member of our church. You might have your name on a roll, but that does not save you. If your role's not in heaven, you're not saved. If you're not in Jesus Christ, you're not saved. So it's about a relationship. And so I think that helps us to understand, to get started off right with salvation. It helps you in your Christian life. A lot of people, they get saved, but then they get so tied into the do's and the don'ts and the touch not, the taste not, the handle not, and what do I do? And they make their, their life with God this religious form. It's called a form of godliness. And the danger in that is you lose the whole purpose of Him saving you. That is to bring you into fellowship with Him. The fellowship of His Son. Salvation is centered around a relationship with Jesus Christ, not a religion. And so when you preach salvation, it's not about a certain church and a certain religion. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to give you some of this, and I gave some of this previously Salvation is not about sacraments, but the Savior. It's not about sacraments. Now, we do not use the word sacrament because, frankly, that's not a Bible word. And I know we use sometimes theological words that are not Bible words to explain biblical things. I get that. But the word sacrament is connected to the word sacred, and it's connected to the word saint. And it implies that the sacrament has power behind it. It has saving work behind it. And that's exactly what Roman Catholicism teaches and some of the other groups. And when we study in the Bible, we have what we call ordinances of the church. And there are only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. But what we find in religion, even in Protestantism and even in evangelicalism is, like I gave some before in the mainline denominations, you have this double speak to where they say, oh yeah, you're saved by faith in God, however... You experience that faith when you're born again in the waters of baptism. Or you experience that faith when you share in the presence of Christ when you take the wine and the bread. And they trip over their feet. No wonder people think, oh, I'm saved now because I got baptized. Or I'm saved now because I ate the little cookie. So we want to make sure we understand that 1 Corinthians chapter 11, as we go through these ordinances here, that the ordinances are not sacraments, they do not save you. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, Paul mentions this, verse number 23. I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Obviously, that's not literal. Jesus Christ's physical body's in front of them. It's okay for some of the Bible to be allegorical or metaphorical or figurative. That's certainly okay. I mean, we use a lot of things in common speech in, in figurative in figurative way. You say, you know, we say a lot of things that aren't hard bone literal. And so this is obviously the case. He wasn't handing his finger and said, okay, chew on it for a little while. Make sure you break the skin and suck some of the blood out of it. That's ridiculous. I'm sorry. I see some of the ladies' faces cringe, you know. And I say that because of John chapter number 6. Jesus said the statement in front of all of the crowd. He says, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And everybody's like, Whoa, this is a hard saying. 
But then he interprets it. He says, as I live by the Father, so he that eateth me and drinketh my blood liveth by me. Jesus didn't literally eat the Father. God's a spirit. Then he said, my words are spirit, they are life. He was simply just giving them allegory and giving them figurative language to understand that you've got to have Jesus Christ or you're not going to have eternal life. That's as simple as that. That's easy. And so, this thing with the Lord's Supper, although it's simple, it has been pulled and twisted since going back to the first few centuries. Notice in verse number 25, After the same manner also he took the cup when he supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often you drink it in remembrance of me. Some churches say, well, it says cup singular, so you're not biblical unless you have one cup. The priest takes a little sip, he wipes it, he passes it, and he hands it there. He wipes off his COVID, and he passes it to you. So you can put your COVID on it, and, and that's the only way you can get eternal life. What are, you, what are they doing now? Of course, now they have little disposable ones. I guess next time we do communion, we'll have them. They have it where you just peel back the top, and then you drink the juice. So that'll be a good way. We don't have to handle it and sneeze in it and everything else. But they say, well, see, this cup, this one cup, and that's how Jesus did. He passed it around. Is that really a big deal? Is it a big deal? It's like these churches are making all these... It's, that's religion. And I'm not saying we don't need to be straight when the Bible says make it straight. But what I'm saying is some people are majoring on the minors. Well, you know, you had, you know, 100 people in church and you had 100 little cups. That's not biblical. We're supposed to have one cup. I'm not drinking after 100 people. I'm sorry. That just ain't happening. Whether there's COVID or there's not COVID. I love you, but I ain't sharing a cup with you. Amen. I might share a Chick-fil-A sandwich with you. That's a different, different deal. Now, here are the four views on, uh, on the Lord's Supper. They call it the Eucharist um, in Catholicism and Orthodox, which means Thanksgiving. They call it the Mass. I call it the Mess, but uh, you've heard of Chris Mass before, I'm sure. Uh, transubstantiation, this is the teaching. It's called transubstantiation from Catholicism, that the bread and wine literally changes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. The recipient actually eats the Lord's body and drinks His blood because Jesus is literally being sacrificed in the Mass. That is that's verbatim from their own books, their own theology. You say, that's not what they believe. You don't know what you're talking about. That's what they believe. You say, well, I know a Catholic and he don't believe that. There's a lot of Catholics that make F's and D's and C's. Amen. Consubstantiation instead of transubstantiation is the teaching that the bread and wine actually contain the body and blood of Jesus, but do not literally change into it. See how this, they're kind of like the news media. They can keep talking and talking and talking, and next thing you know, there's all this double speak going on. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, it's raining outside. The precipitation mass is current with the static electricity in the clouds. and the, Just tell me, is it raining or is it not raining? Nah, blah, 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 consubstantiation. It contains the, but, blo, the body and blood of Jesus, but do not literally change. Christ is actually present within and under the elements. Under this view, according to this view, the recipient receives the forgiveness of sins and the confirmation of their faith through the elements. This is the Lutheran view. Then you have the Reformed view, like in the Presbyterian churches. This is the view that Christ is not literally present in the elements, but there is a spiritual presence of Christ in the elements. The recipient receives grace through partaking of the elements, and this, of course, is unbiblical just like the other two. The, the biblical view is the memorial view. In other words, we're looking back to what Jesus did as a memory. As you see in this text, verse number 25 and 24, this do in remembrance of me. You say, why does Paul talk about the danger and the decision here? And he says, you do show the Lord's death till he come. By the way, you want to always not only look back to his first coming, but look forward to his second coming. But he goes through and he says, let a man examine himself and drink of that bread, eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. This was a time when believers would come together and it had to do with discerning the Lord's body. It had to do with not just with fellowship between you and Jesus, but when you have Lord's Supper, you want to make sure you don't have bitterness, animosity, hatred, strife, with the body of believers that are present. That's why it talks about discerning the Lord's body. So it's a time of self-examination. 
And people get confused because later on he says, if you don't judge yourself, you're condemned. And he says, uh, he uses the word in verse um, 29, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Well, see, that means you go to hell if you don't take the... That's not what it says at all. Somebody that's saved can't go to hell. The word damnation is the word condemnation. So there's another, obviously, reference to damnation. The word saved is not always used in the sense of being saved from hell and going to heaven. He talks about save yourselves from this generation. You ever have to save yourself from a crowd? They start burning down stuff, you run in the other direction. Amen. Save yourself from a crowd. Um, save yourselves from this untoward generation. That's not talking about your soul being saved from hell. Consequently, the word damnation is not always used as far as eternal hellfire damnation. The damnation in the passage has to do with judging yourselves. Verse number 32, when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. There's a preparation, then there's a participation. So there's a chastening process and then hopefully a changing process. You judge yourself so God doesn't have to whip you when you get outside. In other words, if you don't get things right between you and the Lord and consequently you and whatever brother you have a problem with, you're going to have a sin problem in your life that's going to fester and the Lord's going to have to take the belt off and you will be chastened. He says it got so bad with some people. Notice in verse number 30, this caused many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. So if you get sick, you have something happen in your life, the first thing you need to examine is your own walk with God and your walk with other people. Amen. That's not popular, but that's 1 Corinthians 11. But people have taken these passages and they've used them, especially clergy and especially religion, especially when you had, you know, 90% of the people that didn't read, especially didn't read Latin. And then you have churches using these verses, and especially when they show this is the book of God and this is what it says, and people are like, oh, I've got to take that stuff and I've got to do what the priest says or I'm going to go to hell. And you have... Whatever century we're in, 21st century people walking around supposedly intelligent with all this knowledge that think they have to be baptized in water to go to heaven. Are you that ignorant? That is sad that somebody would think water is going to get them to heaven. Water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. All right, now let's look at a few more and we'll be done. The standard, this is number six, isn't relative righteousness but absolute righteousness. So when we talk about salvation, the simplicity of it, the standard is not relative righteousness. Look over in Romans chapter 3. We'll just look at a few references. Salvation is simple. If you're saved, you need to thank God. Read your Bible. Enjoy it. Don't doubt your salvation. Don't question it. Don't make it more complicated than it is. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have eternal life. Praise the Lord. Don't doubt it. Don't question it. You're not going to be able to lose it because it's not yours to lose in the first place. He is eternal life. 1 John chapter 5, the last verse. He is the true God and eternal life. And if you have Jesus Christ, you have Him. Look in Romans chapter number 3. So here's the next thing. Standard, the standard isn't relative righteousness but absolute righteousness. This is where everybody gets confused. And this is where... Especially in religion, people get confused with discipleship and salvation. Even in Baptist churches oftentimes. They confuse discipleship and salvation. Because oftentimes, as they go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke especially, you're reading all these references where Jesus Christ is dealing with the kingdom gospel. So he's talking a lot about discipleship. And consequently, when he heals someone or he forgives someone, he says, Thy faith have saved thee. And you're thinking, oh, they're saved like me. Well, they don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit because Christ hasn't died on the cross yet. So then you take all of those verses and then in the same context, he'll talk about discipleship. So consequently, people begin to see personal righteousness on the same line of God's righteousness. And so they think that salvation is not only God saving me, it's things that I do to prove that I'm saved. Your salvation is not based on your righteousness at all. And the Methodists need to get a good dose of this, and the Assembly of God and Pentecostals need to get a good dose of this. And by the way, Church of God and Assembly of God, a lot of them preach a pretty straight salvation message, and they'll do it pretty good. Even sometimes Methodists will. However, this idea of personal righteousness always seems to come up because they're putting discipleship right there with salvation. 
Trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and make sure you make Him Lord of all. And they make somebody, are you willing to lay down those cigarettes? Well, if you're not willing to do that, you're not ready to get saved. Okay, well, make sure if they have cholesterol problems, they're going to lay down their eggs. Because the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and if you're going to eat too many eggs, you're going to wind up having a heart attack. We don't want you to defile the temple of the Holy Ghost. So I don't think you can get saved if you eat eggs. <laughs> don't take that out of context. I love eggs. <laughs> Fried. Scrambled. I'm not too much on poached. Romans chapter number 3. The standard isn't relative righteousness. Your righteousness is absolute righteousness. Romans 3.21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, it's for everybody, and upon all, it's only put on those, Look at it, that believe, for there is no difference, for all of sin and comes short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that's that satisfactory sacrifice we preached about, through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So God says, I'm going to make you just, and the only way I can do that is the guarantee it's going to happen. And that only way to do that is to give you my imputed right. I'm going to impute my righteousness to you so you're, you have my righteousness, not your own, because your own ain't no good. You might last good for maybe two or three seconds, and then you blow it. You go two or three more seconds, and you blow it again for another four or five hours, then you blow it again, you get it, and you blow it, and you get it, and you blow it. God says, I'll give you my righteousness. Then it's a Sealed deal. And then when God justifies you, He can be just and the justifier. He can say, you know what? Hey, this person indeed is innocent. Look at them. They live an impeccable life. Matter of fact, all I see is my son's righteousness. I see sinlessness. Amen. Of course they go into heaven. Nobody but a sinless person is going to heaven. And if God doesn't declare you sinless by way of the righteousness of His son, you're not going to go to heaven. Right. All right, now take a right turn. You're in Romans. Look in chapter 5. You have to understand there's a difference in your righteousness and God's righteousness. You have to get that. Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter 5, look down if you will, in verse number 18. Therefore, Romans 5, 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, which was who? Adam. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. The righteousness of one, not you, Jesus Christ. Right turn, one more place, and we'll move on to the next one. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Romans chapter 10, verse number 1. This was Paul's burden. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. You see the two? There's God's righteousness, and then there's individual righteousness. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, here it is, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Whose righteousness is that? That's a man's personal righteousness. That's why Old Testament and New Testament salvation are different because in the Old Testament a man had his personal righteousness that he was being judged by. Thank God I'm not being judged by my personal righteousness. Verse number 6, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. So you see the contrast. All right. So we understand the standard is God's righteousness. So in that sense, man, it looks hard because all of sin and come short of the glory of God. But here's the great deal about salvation, not just the simplicity of it, but the wonderful news of it. That's why it's called the gospel, the good news. Glad tidings. Because God says, you can't make it. Your righteousness is no good. I will, if, you, if you'll take me, if you'll take my son, I will give you my righteousness as a free gift. Then you can't miss you can't but help get into heaven. Alright, now 
Next one, look in uh, Ephesians chapter 2. You already know that one pretty good, so turn to Titus chapter 3. I'll quote Ephesians for you. Titus chapter number 3. Salvation is simple. It is by God's grace, not human effort. We've covered this in great detail, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. Titus chapter number 3. Salvation is by God's grace, not human effort. Ephesians 2, you know the verse, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Then he emphasizes it, not of works, lest any man should boast. So he emphasizes that so we understand it's not human effort. We're saved by God's grace. Titus chapter 3, look in verse number 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now here's where when you listen to some of those quotes from Reformed theologians and things like that, and even the Reformers and even uh, some of the uh, Confessions of Faith I read you before, some of that stuff sounds good. You know, we believe in salvation by grace through faith alone. But then whenever they begin to continue to talk in their theological verbiage, but not by a faith that is alone, and you can get that grace conferred upon you, when you're born into the church, which takes place at baptism. And so all these things, they make one statement. So it's not so much that we're mad at some of the things they say, it's the things they add to it. And so you have the pure gospel, and then you begin to add a little stuff. The Bible says in Galatians, a little leaven leaven at the whole lump. Here's the facts of the matter. You can trust Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, and go to heaven and never darken a door of the church. Can you believe a preacher just said that? Because a preacher wants people to come to church. You can trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and never be baptized You can tr and go to heaven. You can trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and never take communion and go to heaven. You can trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and never sing a hymn. Never read your Bible completely all the way through. So I can't believe a preacher would say that. Well, you need to make sure you double-check your theology. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. If a person has trusted Jesus, you say, well, if they're really saved, they're going to have fruit. Okay, where does that stop? You stopped it with baptism, reading your Bible through at least once, uh, taking communion and coming to church. My list is a little better than yours. I would say you don't need to gossip. You don't need to covet anything that's not yours. Uh, you don't need to be lazy. I would say read your Bible three or four times a year. And I would say come to church every service. And that's the, so just at least lead a few people to Christ every year. And at least, you know, get into the Old Testament idea of tithing, which was 20 or 30 percent. Um, you want to keep going? <laughs> By their fruits you shall know them, faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. Bless God, if you're, what you have won't bring you back to church on Sunday night, what you makes you think is going to take you to heaven. That might make good camp meeting retread type of preaching to get somebody to doubt their salvation where you can get somebody to the altar and make you feel like you led somebody to Christ because you ain't led anybody to Christ in 30 years. But that's not biblical New Testament salvation. I'm not saying people don't need to come to church. I'm not saying people don't need to be baptized. They don't need to read their Bibles. I'm not saying all of that. You, get, you understand that. I'm simply telling you salvation is about Jesus Christ, not a church building. Some people are freaked out, especially as this craziness in our society with all the stuff that's taking place. There are some people that they're not going to get in crowds anymore. They may never get in a crowd anymore. You say, what's going to happen? Oh, well, hopefully they can read their Bible, they can grow in their faith, and hopefully if they're saved, they can continue to grow. Let me finish up here. Thank God salvation is by God's grace, not human effort. If it was up to me and you to get that standard of perfect righteousness, we wouldn't be able to do it. There's no way. So Christ lived the life that we couldn't live, and then he died the death that we deserved. And then I want to give you this one. Obviously, you know these. We'll have to turn. Uh, maybe we'll turn to one. Go to Romans chapter 4. Salvation is a gift, not a reward. And the idea that people have, and some of this stuff's theological, but you run into it when you talk to people. So that's why I'm giving this to you, because you're, it's going to click when you're talking to somebody. Say, yeah, you know, I'm trying. I say, hey, you, you know if you're going to heaven when you die? Well, I'm working on it. They're giving you a theological statement. They just don't know the terms. Perseverance, okay? 
perseverance of the saints. They're giving you some of the stuff, but they don't understand. Their, their idea is that salvation is a reward. You get eternal life after you get there. You know, you cross the finish line, and then hopefully God's going to weigh your good with your bad, and he'll decide whether or not he's going to reward you with eternal life. That's not New Testament salvation. New Testament salvation, number one, is instantaneous. Once you trust Jesus Christ by faith, he gives you everlasting life right then and there. You don't have to wait to cross the finish line. You have him, you have eternal life, and you're plugged into that which is eternal, the Alpha and Omega. But... People get this idea that it's a reward, and so I have to earn it based on my righteousness. If you can explain to them, look, the only way you're going to make it is live a sinless life. If you can live a sinless life and then somebody can kill you and you can come up three days from the dead, you got it, man. You could do it all by yourself. You don't need Jesus. But if you can't do that, you better find another way, and the Bible tells you another way, and that is simply to put faith in what Jesus Christ already did. Admit that you're a sinner and you can't save yourself. That's the hard part. Pride with a capital P comes in. It's not a reward. It's a gift. Romans 6.23, you know the verse, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life. Sin will give you a wage. You can get your reward if you want to live in this life, and that is death and hell. But God gives you a gift. Look in Romans chapter 4, verse number 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you're working for someone, you're not a slave, you're actually employed, you actually get a wage. They, you're, you're in, they are indebted to pay you. There's a contract going on here. You, are, you have something coming to you. That's not how it is with salvation. One thing you have coming to you as a sinner is death and hell. Salvation is a gift. And so that's why grace is contrasted with works. Verse number 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Your faith is counted for righteousness. In other words, God will take your faith, then you say, okay, I'm going to take that faith right there, and then I'm going to impute to you, I'm going to, I've counted that for righteousness, so I'm going to give that righteousness on your account now. So I take your faith, and then I give you that righteousness, the righteousness of God. So it's a gift. Finally, I'll give you this, and I've already kind of hit it a little bit. Salvation is simple. It's not baptism, but belief. Baptism, not baptism, but belief. We are Baptists, thank God. Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. We all know that. I'm a Baptist, and I really believe, and as I study history, and I love to read up on history, I believe the Baptists have been very influential in church history in keeping the gospel of the grace of God and evangelism with the simple gospel out there. I'm talking about all Baptists. I know there's all kind of offshoots and, and all kind of different Baptists. I, I get that. Um, but here's the thing. We're Baptists, but Baptists for the most part. Now, there may be people that, you know, or you go to church. Yeah, I, I go to such as Baptist church. And they've been there, you know, maybe they were Easter and Christmas, maybe five Christmases and 15 Easter's ago. And they say, yeah, I'm saved because I was baptized. But if you are a Baptist and you've been listening to a Baptist preacher preach about salvation long enough, you know baptism does not save you. But we have the word Baptist on our name. And all these other groups believe baptism saves you, and they don't even have the word Baptist on their name. That's funny to me. Now here's where some of the problem comes in. I'll try to give you a synopsis in a nutshell. You can go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 8. It really starts with Jewish baptism before Calvary. And yes, there is a Jewish baptism that is for the gospel of the kingdom of heaven that John is baptizing people. And you read about it in John chapter number 1. He says, to manifest Christ to Israel, verse number 31, am I come baptizing? John 1, 31, John said, I'm baptizing so Israel knows that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's the purpose. And it was a baptism of repentance. And they had to come turning to a future 
Messiah and in a transition from that Old Testament law realizing the old cloth is going to be changed with the new and the old bottles are changing for the new and they had to follow what John was saying. Every disciple of Jesus Christ, when I say that I mean the twelve, they were all followers of John first. They had to be. And you know that from John, Acts chapter number 1, rather, when they elected someone to replace Judas, they said, they, they said he had to start with the baptism of John. Peter and Andrew and all those guys followed John first. And that was a Jewish baptism of repentance. Now, here's where all, all the complication comes in. You're in Acts chapter 8. When you get to Peter's baptism in Acts chapter 2, he makes this statement. He says, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to our, our fathers and as many as the Lord our God shall call. He's preaching a Jewish baptism just like John to a Jewish audience. However, now because Christ has risen from the dead, when they get baptized, this did not happen with John. When they get baptized, they get the Holy Spirit. So that throws in all these ideas. And you have churches down the road. If you see a church that says Church of Christ, they believe in what is called baptismal regeneration, which is really the same thing the Catholics have been saying all along. It's the same thing the Presbyterians have been saying, although they've softened it a little bit. It's the same thing that uh, Wesley said. I'm about to read you what Luther said. And it simply is going back to John chapter number 3, and you wonder, Lord, why did you say that? And I would never question the Lord, but he says in John chapter number 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord, that's great. But then he goes on to say, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So people say, see, that's the new birth, being baptized, because of Acts chapter 2. Of course, in John chapter 3, verse number 6, he says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That explains the water birth, <laughs> the water. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So there's no baptism in John chapter number 3, although John Wesley cites John chapter 3 as baptism. And although Luther's catechism, infants too are to be baptized. Because holy baptism is the only means whereby infants who too must be born again can ordinarily be regenerated and brought to faith. It's the same thing Catholicism teaching. You're born again when you're sprinkled as a baby. You are not born again. Nobody's born again when they're sprinkled as a baby. Of course, the Presbyterians later on say, look, we know that they have to profess faith and the blood of Christ will wash them when they profess faith. But they get into the church because they do not make a dispensational distinction between kingdom and church. Therefore, the church is the kingdom to them. So when you're baptized, because that supposedly replaces circumcision, now you're a covenant people, so now you have the passage, and I can really mess people up with verses. The passage over in Corinthians where he says, you know, if a husband and wife are married and one of them's not saved, you know the passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, else were your children unclean, now they're holy. Talking about an unbeliever and a believer being married. We'll see now... As long as we have a believing parent, they can be a part of the church. And then later on, hopefully they can grow in their faith. Salvation to them is not an instantaneous decision. It's a process by which they grow. But they teach you're baptized and then you get saved. Born again, rather, at that point. And then later on, you grow in your faith. But the confusion comes from Acts chapter 2. And then when you get over here in Acts chapter 8, you find a little bit of clarity. Notice in Acts chapter number 8, a great passage, because here we have a Gentile being preached to by Philip. He's reading Isaiah 53, and he doesn't understand what he reads. Verse number 35, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they were on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37, been taken out of the new Bible. So if you have a new Bible, you can just close your eyes. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Before he was baptized, he made a profession of faith. Verse number 38, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water. Why do you think they went down into the water? Now, if you sprinkle somebody, you wouldn't have to go down into the water. You could just get a bowl, and you could get the water, and you could just say, Hey, I'm going to throw it on your head. You're baptized. One, two, three. But they go both down into the water. Look in verse number 38. And Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Here's a Gentile getting baptized. After he makes a profession of faith, 
You say, well, we're, good, we're doing good. Yeah, but you got a problem when you get over to chapter number uh, 10. You get to a situation where you have Cornelius. This is where the Pentecostals come in because they see a guy speak in tongues like, oh, that proves that he was saved. Well, the eunuch didn't speak in tongues and he's a Gentile. How come he didn't speak in tongues? I'll tell you the answer. In Acts chapter number 10, Peter doesn't understand what he's doing preaching to a Gentile because he's told not to in Matthew chapter number 10. And so he's there with other Jewish brethren. They see Cornelius speak in tongues and they're like, wow, he got the Holy Ghost before he got baptized. Because that's exactly what happened back in Acts chapter number 2 when we knew that the promise of the Father that Jesus mentioned was going to come when we tarried in Jerusalem. And that was the promise mentioned in John chapter 14 and 16 that the Holy Spirit would permanently indwell the believers. Peter connects that to Acts chapter 2. And what did they do in Acts chapter 2? They spoke in tongues. So now he sees a Gentile speak in tongues. He says, he must have the Holy Spirit. And so now he baptizes him. That's where the whole Pentecostal people go off the, off the deep end. This is a dangerous book if you don't rightly divide it. If you don't rightly divide this, it will rightly divide you and get you into all kinds of problems. When you get to chapter number 16, we gave the verse earlier, the guy gets saved. There's no Jews around that need confirmation that God spoke because the Bible says tongues are for a sign, right? The Jews require a sign. That's why you see miracles, healings, tongues, all that stuff has nothing to do with a bunch of Gentiles. Even though the Corinthians had a lot of Gentiles in their church, it had to do with the Jewish sign gifts. And as soon as the Jewish nation said no to the gospel repeatedly, those sign gifts disappeared. That's why they disappear until 1906 in Los Angeles, you know. But they really did disappear and they're not back yet. And you'll see some of that stuff return in the Great Tribulation period, I believe, because of the prophecy in Mark chapter number 16. Now, in Acts chapter 16, the guy gets baptized, and of course, he believes with all of his house, and he gets baptized. In conclusion, I want to illustrate the gospel real quick. I've used this several times with kids. I use it with anybody, really. But here's a great illustration. The gospel is simple. Here's the book of your sins. It's a big book. And you look at this book, man, look at all those tiny, tiny words. Man, that's a, you, you've been up to a bunch of mischief. Look at all that stuff you've done. From the beginning of your life to the end of your life, you get into this thing. That's exactly what you and I deserve. It's the book of your sins. Here's the book of Jesus Christ. You open it up. He's led as a lamb without spot. Jesus Christ never sinned at all. Nothing. I mean, 33 and a half years, sinless. Of course, he deserves heaven. That's the life of Jesus Christ. When you trust Christ as your personal Savior, this becomes your life. My tape's so old, it don't want to stick. That becomes your life. Imputed righteousness given to you. So when God looks at your life, that's what he sees. The life of Jesus Christ. And all your sins have been put on Christ. And he died. He already paid the penalty. He died for him. And your sins have been judged. And this is, this is your life now. We don't deserve that at all. It's a free gift. And it's by God's grace and mercy that he gave it to us. So when we get to heaven, we can't say, I'm here because I did something. Do you see what I did? I added a lot. No, man, I'm here because of the life Jesus Christ lived. The atoning death sacrifice that he gave. It's all because of him. That's the simplicity of the gospel. If someone will take Jesus Christ, he'll give them everlasting life. What a trade. Amen? Amen. All right, let's have a word of prayer be dismissed. Lord, thank you for your greatness and your goodness. Thank you for the simplicity of salvation. Father, I pray that you might help us to not complicate matters, not try to get into arguments, but just to tell people the simple truth. And Lord, we know people are confused, and a lot of times they don't even understand where the confusion comes from. Lord, we know where it comes from. It comes from the devil. And we know that he's behind a lot of these religions. Lord, help us to cut through the chaos and just give the simple gospel. And Lord, we thank you for the simple gospel. Thank you for saving our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.